thanks to all of you here in Davos and those around the world who've contacted us. Uh, we may not have heartened you about the prospect of what lies ahead, but I hope we've enlightened you on the enormity of what still faces us all. From me, Nick Gowing, in Davos, bye-bye. spirited as possible, not speeches, so put your cards away. Um, and we want to generate this as much from the floor and also from social media. Uh, and rather than me, I'm here really to just act as the ringmaster. I'm not going to interview you particularly. So it's for, the, it's for people here to generate um, their concerns and everything else. Uh, Leah, what do you want to do about the, the live... Okay. Right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to brief you in a moment, but I've got to go and do a live um, uh, promo, promotion as we call it, um, for the debate, which is going out live on BBC World News, literally as it happens here. So I'll tell you how we're going to do it when I've done this, but let's get this out of the way first. And first of all, can you all remove your badges? Um, it's my moment of power. But don't lose them, because otherwise you won't be able to get anywhere in the building afterwards. <laughs> otherwise, it looks like you, you... Some of you have heard me... S right, we're just going live, so please, could you stand by, please? <coughs> I'm Nick Gowing, live at the World Economic Forum in Davos. What about the optimism? Can any of us have any optimism that the deepening world economic crisis will be reversed anytime soon? What must change to achieve it? What is the outlook? Join me after this short news summary for the BBC World Debate. The year for reinventing capitalism. Right, uh, let me brief, or if any of you have got spaces, if you could come in a little bit, because we're not sure with snow, security and everything else, it would be better, be better if we didn't have any, any uh, large gaps in the audience at this stage. We're never quite sure whether 150, 1,000 people or 50 people are going to turn up at this time on a Friday morning, when many of you have, you have been up until 2 o'clock. We're going live in about five or six minutes. Let me just tell you... Um, we are going to encourage you, this is a bit of an experiment. If, uh, I'm not going to tell you to switch off your smartphones or your laptops or your iPads or whatever. There will be a hashtag up there and you sitting in the audience can help contribute to that. I can get the, um, the messages coming up here. So you can contribute without necessarily raising your hand. We have uh, been soliciting for, uh, for contributions and several people have contributed offered uh, to speak already, and some of them are in the front row. So don't think that we've pre-selected them, but they uh, took up the invitation, which is widespread, to uh, contribute beforehand. And so we've got an idea of the kind of things that people want to talk about. If you're a bit jet-lagged or you had a great party until 4 o'clock in the morning and you've come here to sleep, please don't. Um, <clears throat> one or two of you heard me say this before, but there is a great bit of video of someone sleeping and snoring um, during a debate. Not because the debate was bad, but because they were jet-lagged. Um, if you feel you're going to have to leave before 5 to 10, could you just position yourself uh, on one of the fringes? We are going to be live, and it would be much better if you didn't um, disturb uh, the feeling in the audience by just sort of moving across, because it, it looks uh, pretty impolite. Now... I have said in the past, don't look at your, your, your iPhones and so on, but this is now integral to this kind of discussion as we discovered in the first brainstorming. It's great to have your kind of input. Um, at the end, please, even if you really want to rush out, don't, please, until I say, that's it, because the music will run and it'll see a wide shot of the audience of all of you. So just please stay in your seats. We're not going to re-record it or anything, but just please stay there so it doesn't look as if you're so desperate uh, to get out. Um, 
This will be live, but it'll be broadcast several times over the weekend on BBC World News on television and also on BBC World Service across the multiple BBC global platforms um, of video, sound and, of course, the digi digital platforms as well. Now, there are microphones. There are two uh, Swiss international um, uh, people who've got them. I will try and get that microphone to you. Not everyone's going to be able to speak, of course. Um, and that's about it, I think. Remember, there's a jib up there. Please don't get up because it might hit you. And that's a health and safety announcement for you. And also, just to tell you, if something does go wrong, the exits are over there. Um, yeah. So thank you all for coming. Um, which way would you like people to move quickly? Which, which is the other side? I'll go to the left. <laughs> Here. Well, what do you want? What do you mean on that side? You'd like them to move to this side. Could I just, in two minutes, ask you if some of you could move over to here, please? Thank you. Yeah. Angle, could you just look at camera one, which is over there? Thank you. Uh, we're, we're moving people. They're, Mark, could you help? OK. Thank you very much indeed. It's merely um, because of the way the cameras are shooting. Thank you very much indeed. Pascal, can you just check uh, G-Docs is working, please? Don't worry, there aren't mosquitoes in here. Um, this is a way of syncing up um, stuff. And uh, Neil is our editor as well. Uh, yes. Um, right, which is that one? The pre-title link. The pre-title link you want. Do we have the time for that? Yes. Okay, got it, yeah. Okay. I th okay, well, I think you're pushing your luck there. No. Yeah. Ker Kerry, are you happy? Pascal, can you just confirm to me that you are communicating with... It is, okay, thank you. The spirit is very much of one of exchange, um, trying to get to the heart of... Welcome at the end of a week when the International Monetary Fund has warned that the global economy is in the danger zone because of the unresolved Eurozone crisis and faces a 1930s uh, moment because things remain so bad. Well, joining our world debate in Davos, Leo Brennard, Under Secretary at the US Treasury. Ms. Brennard is Chief Advisor to Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner for International Affairs. Nouriel Roubini is the economist renowned for predicting the dire impact of the 2008 financial collapse. His gloomy predictions earned him the nickname Dr. Doom. Angul Guria is Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which analyzes the economies of 34 countries, most in the developed world. Plus, Anders Borg, Finance Minister from Sweden. He was voted European Finance Minister of the Year by the Financial Times newspaper. Before helping to rescue Sweden's economy, he worked in the banking sector. That's our panel. Welcome to you all. 
Well, we've invited our global audience to raise issues and questions to our world debate panel via email, Facebook, and Twitter. Whether in this room in Davos or around the world, you can tweet your thoughts during this live debate. The hashtag is BBC Davos. Well, our debate issue is 2012, the year for capitalism to be reinvented, question mark. Let me just check with our audience here. Who thinks capitalism is without flaws and does not need to be reinvented? Does anyone think that? There are two or three people here. We'll hope to hear from you later. How bad are things? Well, let's get a swift view, please, of the way things are moving. Angel Guria, the view from the OECD. Capitalism with a K, you know, it uh, used to be... a uh, a bad word. I do, I'm, not, I'm going to talk about market economies uh, rather than capitalism. And I don't think we have to reinvent it. We just have to have good policies. If we have good economic policies, fiscal policies, growth policies, employment policies, social policies, environmental policies, it's, we're going to get it right. So it's not a question of saying that we have to reinvent capitalism or substitute it for some of the alternatives we know that did not work in the past. Are you optimism? Yes. Or pessimistic at the moment. Yes, I'm optimistic that we know what the solutions are. I'm less optimistic about whether we are actually taking the right decisions to put them in place. Lael Brennard, your assessment at the moment from the U.S. Treasury. I think the uh, big challenge uh, for us in the U.S., and I think it's the same challenge um, with different characteristics for China and for the euro area, uh, is to grow differently. Uh, going into the crisis, there were large imbalances uh, and growth was increasingly unfair, unequal. Going forward, we're very focused on charting a path on growth that is more balanced uh, and more fair. In the U.S., it means really restoring the American dream, making sure that American families have a fair share and a fair shot, not through excessive leverage that they cannot afford, but through the ability to uh, raise their earnings, send their children to school, and to reinforce social mobility. Uh, Does it need US. a new form of capitalism or not? I think it uh, requires uh, large uh, and difficult reforms. And let me say also that China uh, needs to address some of uh, its uh, imbalances, internal inequality, and if it does so in a way that boosts the role of the domestic consumer, it will also help address some of the international imbalances that led to this crisis. Anders Borg, your assessment, how difficult are things? Well, I think we, we, we need to reinvent the way that companies and, and the economy is, is functioning. I think there will be no legitimacy for the market system if we're only talking about short-term profits. So companies have responsibilities to, re, to their employees, to the society. We, can, we cannot have a situation where the companies are only concentrating on bonuses and, and not paying the taxes. So, yeah, we need to have more of a social market economy, I think. A different kind of capitalism, can it be redefined? Can it be reinvented? More social, more responsible, but we also need to understand that, that also the, the political side of things, the welfare states need to be reformed in, in, in the years ahead of us. Nora Rubini. Uh, I would say there is a crisis of capitalism, but there are many different types of capitalism. There was a model that was the Anglo-Saxon model of laissez-faire, free market, not even prudential regulation supervision of the financial system, and that model has proven broken during the last financial crisis. We need proper regulation supervision. There was another model that was the social welfare state of continental Europe, but now we are seeing that that social welfare state is also in a crisis. You have deficits and debt that are becoming unsustainable. Now there's a third model that is emerging of what people refer to as state capitalism, what is being done in China, maybe in part in Russia, in some emerging markets. is sort of working right now in China, but the Chinese themselves say that this is not a model that is sustainable and balanced, and eventually having too much reliance on state-owned enterprises, even in these economies, is going to prove dangerous. So we have really to rethink about how we have the right balance within markets, government, public policy, private enterprise. Well, let me put uh, a few points we've already been getting in uh, here from Howard Buffett, who's the grandson uh, of one of the world's richest men, uh, Warren Buffett, now running his own foundation. He emailed us beforehand saying, capitalism is the greatest driver for development and wealth creation, but at a cost how to make it much fairer for the long term, values-based. Angul Guria, you're nodding agreement. Absolutely, because that is a great challenge. It's not that we need to change the base of the philosophy of a market economy, 
but we need to do it not only stronger, we need to do it cleaner in many ways, uh, and that's environmental, but also uh, get it rid of some of the uh, uglier aspects, the darker aspects, but we need to make it fairer, and fairer is something that is missing. Inequalities are growing. Unemployment and inequalities together are creating the indignados and people taking Tahir Square and people occupying Wall Street all over the world because they're, we are in danger of frustrating a whole generation. Leo Brenner, just picking up on that uh, issue from Howard Buffett, uh, th there's, a long, there's a cost at the moment, a cost. They're the grandson of one of the richest men in the world. Well, you know, in the U.S., uh, you, you saw it going into the crisis. Uh, we did not have supervision in the financial system. We had all kinds of unsound and predatory uh, practices in consumer finance. The incentives uh, in the financial system were terribly skewed to the accumulation of leverage, uh, financial institutions operating with unsound uh, capital buffers, and we're engaged in a very fundamental overhaal of our financial system under the Dodd-Frank Act that will lead to a very different set of incentives, and we hope a set of incentives that will nurture the real economy, that will uh, nurture investments in job-creating areas in the U.S. economy, and that it will lead to a much more, again, fair pattern of growth, balanced pattern of growth. But I think I would go back just to the interdependence among some of the major uh, areas of the world economy. The story in the U.S. in the uh, middle part of the last decade, I think, is very difficult to disentangle that from the very unbalanced growth model that the Chinese uh, were engaged in at the time, which was extraordinarily resource intensive, uh, depended heavily on cheap labor. Uh, cheap credit, excess utilization of resources, an undervalued exchange rate, and led to massive uh, under uh, consumption in the economy and excessive dependence on exports to the advanced right. economies. Okay, L Leo Brenner, thank you. But let me just move on with that, with that issue. We've had uh, Facebook, uh, Faith Katunge here, uh, saying capitalism is some sort of economy tyranny. Anders Borg. Well, I mean, I think to be, be clear, you can combine uh, efficiency in high growth with, with low uh, inequality. Sweden is a country with, with high growth and high social mobility with, with very low, uh, uh, low degrees of inequality. Paradoxically, this is partly due to that we spent the last 20 years to, to reform our welfare state. So it's not only that the market has to be more social, it's also that the social side of the economy, the welfare state, needs to be more market-based. Dorio Rubini. Um, what has happened in the last few years is that there has been a massive increase in income and wealth inequality, not just in the United States, but as the OECD has also suggested, in many other advanced economies. And we have seen also this rise in inequality also in China and other emerging markets. That's becoming a social and political problem. Now, inequality is due to many complex events. Uh, you have uh, 2.5 billion Chindians joining the global labor supply and therefore the wages and the jobs of unskilled workers in US, Europe and Japan are affected. You have winner-take-all effects. You have the effects of regressive taxation. You have a technological change that is biased towards skilled workers rather than unskilled ones. There are many factors that are at work, but unless we deal with this rise in inequality, we'll see a lot of instability. As was pointed out, is the Arab Spring, is Occupy Wall Street, is the riots in London, is the middle class in Tel Aviv saying I cannot afford a home? Is the Chilean student saying I cannot afford education? Even in China, on the micro blocks, people are saying I'm tired of corruption, of inequality, and of this problem. So it's a phenomenon that's global. Let's pick up on that with Salil Shetty from Amnesty International. You want to build on this point, Salil? Uh, thank you, uh, Nick. I think uh, certainly you know, the view on the street uh, from the ordinary people, I think, is that you know, what we've seen in the last year is uh, corporate greed, uh, bankers, financial sector people really sort of getting away uh, with murder, literally, and government complicity, you know, governments and corporations being in bed with each other. So the question is, where is the is account that capitalism? Is that capitalism? Is your worry about capitalism or the way they've been behaving, though? Uh, from Amnesty's perspective, it's not an ism issue. It's an issue about what is the impact on human rights. And I think what we're seeing, it's moving from a financial crisis to a human rights crisis. So the two questions, one is to the panel, 
where is the accountability? A lot of the people who actually caused the crisis are walking around here in the World Economic Forum. You know, is there any accountability? And the second part is, are we going to repeat the mistakes all over again? Because what the, the crisis response people are proposing is to cut further, and the poorest sections, the most vulnerable sections, and women are going to be further affected due to the response, which is to cut back on expenditure. Are we going to repeat mistakes? Lael Brennard. I think there is an inherent uh, tendency uh, in capitalism uh, during periods of boom towards excesses that we see recurring uh, crises. But what matters hugely, obviously, is the balance between the sector of the uh, society which is supposed to hold um, the financial sector accountable. Uh, and how strong uh, your supervisory regulatory environment in the U.S. We clearly had um, massive distortions in the system of incentives, and we are working hard to fix those. And I think if you look at, in the area of compensation, for instance, some of the reforms that we're putting in place with say on pay and risk-based incentives, again, if you look at the attempts to address predatory practices in the consumer finance area, these are fundamental reforms. If we'd had them in place leading into the crisis, we would have had a much different experience. Angel Gurria, your reports are pretty brutal about this issue. Yes, indeed. And uh, I'm reminded, uh, was it that he that said the unacceptable face of capitalism? Uh, well, uh, I think compensation uh, is, is one of them. And, but it can be regulated. It can be codified. The only problem is it looks like we didn't learn very much. You know, you have to read Nouriel's book about what brought about the crisis. And uh, this was one of the things that brought about the crisis, unchecked greed. And now it's happening again. So we don't seem to have learned the lesson. This is a warning shot. We need to continue to focus on that particular issue. That was, by the way, this is not going to solve the problems. It is simply causing this enormous social irritation and adding to the polarization of public opinion and to the indignation of the public. Picking up Celio Shetty's point, though, Anders Borg, you have to sit with a lot of finance ministers and other ministers around the European Union. Are they going to make the same mistakes? Are they going to allow these kind of mistakes to continue? Well, I mean, if we're looking at Greece, Italy, and Spain, they have not had too much of flexible labor market and globalization, but too little. And it's not clear that structural reforms need to increase inequality. For example, Italy, they need to get females onto the labor market to improve gender equality. That is a hidden resource of the Italian society. And if that would happen, it would also equalize income. So right reforms can also improve cohesion if, if, if they are implemented in a good no, manner. No, Rubini, do you believe that they, those at the top, have learned from their mistakes, and therefore Salil Shetty will get a positive answer, which is we're moving in a different direction which won't repeat these mistakes? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. The reforms we have done in the financial system are not enough. The issue of distorted compensation of bankers and traders has not been addressed. Uh, how we regulate derivatives, we'll have to see. Uh, banks were too big to fail now because of consolidation have become even bigger to fail. Are we going to be able to break them up if another crisis uh, does occur? I think there are many question marks about this issue. And in the meanwhile, we have recurrent not only situation which has too much private debt, the crisis was caused by too much debt by households, by banks, by corporates. Now, because of the policy response, we have too much debt in the public sector and too much deficits, and therefore there is now risk of sovereign debt crisis as well. So we are in a very fragile world in which there is a lot of macroeconomic, financial, fiscal, regulatory, taxation uncertainty, but now also political policy and also geopolitical. So it's a very delicate and uncertain world. Angel Guria, just before we go, go on to a few more tweets and Facebook coming in, this issue of leadership. You have been very critical in your reports about leadership, its ability to learn from what's happening and not to repeat it. There is an asymmetry. We know what the solutions are. We know we've got to deal with Greece. We know we've got to deal with the banking system, uh, capitalization and liquidity. We know we have to deal with the firewalls. And we know what size the firewalls have to be to be credible. And we know we have to deal with unemployment. We know we have to deal with inequalities. And we don't. And it's been, uh, you know, 18 months and two years and 30 months, and we still don't. And that is uh, uh, causing an enormous cost to society. Uncertainty has already cost maybe 20, 30, 50 times the total size of the Greek debt. Let me move on with uh, Facebook from Richard Johnson. Capitalism hasn't failed. This is an opportunity to improve it. A more moral capitalism should emerge. Profit 
but not at any cost. Anders Borg, you're nodding agreement. No, I, I strongly agree with that. We, we want to have strong owners and entrepreneurs, but they must direct their energy and their force also to society. Uh, investing in long-term technology and, and, and also behaving in a way that they are strengthening their employees by, by ed providing education. The issue here of profit. In other words, profit is, uh, there's too much of it, but not at any cost. That's that, what that Facebook says. Well, I definitely agree. If you see profit by taking money out of our, our, our Swedish society, for example, and putting them on some Channel Island and, and avoiding your taxes, that's bad. Uh, if you're providing profit by, 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 by an entrepreneurial product that is that's improving the world, that's good. But there must be a moral difference between do, these kind of profits, and the business side must behave in a much more moral and sensible manner. I would add that in addition to the moral aspect of unfairness of inequality, it's not even efficient because we are redistributing right now income from labor to capital, from workers to firms, from poorer people to richer people. But those who are workers and poorer have a greater marginal propensity to consume and spend, while firms and richer people have a greater propensity to save rather than spend. So that redistribution of income is reducing overall aggregate demand and is reducing jobs and income growth and therefore growth rate of the economy. So in addition to the moral issue of the unfairness of it, from an economic point of view it doesn't make sense. Today, the share of labor income in the United States is 58%, the lowest we've had in decades. It used to be 64. That has an economic effect. That's one of the reasons why there is not enough consumption and demand. We have to reverse it. Leo Brenner, that issue of profit, that's a perception out there. There's too much profit. The, the cost of profit is simply too high, certainly, and that's what this current crisis is showing. Look, uh, in the U.S. system, let me just speak to that, uh, capitalism, it's, it's not, that's not the issue. The issue is how does uh, U.S. society and government uh, create incentives on the one hand to ensure that capital is directed to productive uses that generate jobs, that invest in the long-term competitiveness of our real economy, and uh, essentially a tax system that ensures that that core U.S. value of social mobility, equality of opportunity, is safeguarded. And of course, we didn't have that under the previous administration. What we had were tax cuts for the wealthiest part of society, which, as Nouriel said, was already gaining the largest shares of the gains. And so, you know, we have to go back to the critical reforms that we're undertaking right now, looking at the tax system, looking critically and making deep and this, I differ with Nouriel on this, we are making deep fundamental reforms to the structure of our financial system that will make it sounder and safer in the future. Thank you, Gurria. I think this is perhaps one of the problems. Uh, it's not capitalism and it's not even profits. Frankly, it's absolutely legitimate to have uh, the proper kind of profits. The problem is, you mentioned leadership. In the case of the United States, for example, because we focus too much on Europe, uh, it seems that today, because of the political polarization, it's difficult even to agree on the time of the day, much less to make these very fundamental changes that are required. Now, uh, President Obama has been pushing job projects, he's been pushing for, you know, health care, he's been pushing migration issues, he's been pushing, num and, and all of them are either stalled or are being challenged uh, by a very polarized public opinion. This is uppermost in the minds of people. It's not challenging capitalism or profits, it is whether the governance of the process, and that is in, in, in Japan, whether we've had seven uh, governments in the last uh, six years, or uh, in the 13 or 17 changes in the 34 countries of the OECD, in, in the people who are uh, leading politically, or uh, the problem of uh, the lack of capacity to agree in Europe or in the United States. This governance issue is just as important as challenging capitalism ideologically or talking uh, Ill, uh, Ill about profits. Right, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, tweets and other things coming in at the moment. George Manju, who's actually uh, here uh, in, the, in the auditorium, uh, saying that we need a cleaner, responsible capitalism, take away some of the uglier aspects. Why are you saying that? Because I think the focus has uh, so far been on profits and not too much on some of the issues that already the panel talked about, which is inequalities in employment, uh, particularly youth employment, etc. And th that's the reason why I say that. But capitalism itself, are you against capitalism? No, I think we should make money because uh, that, that's efficient. There's an economic reason to it. But we also need to look at the other aspects that were mentioned before. But w what do you think needs to be worked on then? I think um, going back to the governance uh, 
point that was mentioned. I think that's where how policies are set, how the leadership thinks, how the decisions are made. I think that needs to be different from how it was done so far. Can I move across to uh, Neri Woods, who's from the School of Government in Oxford University. Your worries about jobs. Um, yes, I've got two concerns, but one is what about the short-termism of capitalism? At its core is the publicly owned company. At Davos last year, there was a discussion which said, look, the CEOs are only there for three or four years. The, shareholder, the shares change hands four times a day. The boards are not independent or expert. Who's holding them to account? Where would each of you begin to make the companies which fire capitalism more long-termist? And what have each of you done personally What's the most significant thing you've done in the last year to create jobs? This issue of long-termism. Angul Gurria. Well, uh, we've been looking at the multinational enterprise code of conduct, at the corporate social responsibility of enterprises, at the corporate guidelines. We've updated them, we've upgraded them, uh, and precisely with, a, with, a, with an eye on the a medium and the long term, and the permanence Does of the Does anyone take structures. any notice, though? Yes, uh, they are taking notice more and more. I think millions of people are better off because these things are happening, even if they don't know who they owe it to. We won't charge them for any author's rights anyway. And as Borgs. <laughs> well, we actually had the highest uh, private sector employment growth of the whole OECD area last year, so I, I think we did pretty well in, in creating But why growth. was that? Well, I mean, we have been very consistent in doing structural reforms and, and also investing in, in education. So, I mean, education, I think, is, is a very important thing here. We have the highest degree of social mobility for one reason, that is, is because we're providing free, good public education for everybody. And the so, lowest inequality. And the lowest inequality. This issue of long-termism, though, Leo Brenner, when you're sitting in Washington and you have to look at the short-term versus the long-term, this worry of Neri Woods there about long-termism, well, I'll tell you, our concerns uh, about the long term have to do with the ability uh, in the U.S. Uh, of our political system to come to grips with the long term challenges of growth and fairness in our economy. And so you see it uh, in the debate uh, over our fiscal future. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to come together across the political uh, spectrum and agree that the solution has to be balanced over the medium, over the long term. Entitlements need to be on the table, but so too do revenues in order to invest in the long term financial solidity of our country. With regard to the competitiveness of our economy, infrastructure investments in the US have been neglected for too long. And we need to find a way for us to come together across the public sector and the private sector to invest in the fundamental long term competitiveness of our economy. Nora Rabini, this long-termism versus this short-term problem. As well, Mary Woods it's, has pointed a, it's out. a problem, as was pointed out, both in the private sector, given governance of corporation, of banks, and so on. And in addition to that, there is also the problem that we have privatized gains in good times and socialized losses in bad times. But there's also a problem in the public sector because we live in democracies. That's good, but there are these electoral pressures, and you have to be reelected. And doing the kind of policies that imply short-term cost and benefits only in the medium term or long term is hard because you might not be re-elected. In the case of the Eurozone, unfortunately, we have 17 countries, 17 governments, 17 coalitions. They cannot agree within their own coalition, let alone with the opposition, let alone internationally. And that's a source of gridlock, of delay in the policy response and market then reacting to it. And we need also to coordinate policies at the international level because many of these problems are not national, they are supranational. So you need also international policy governance at the international level. Let me give you an idea of some of the responses we're getting in, uh, certainly on Twitter here, from Adelina Marini. OK profit, but not at any cost. Who is going to say how much? Uh, from Florian Minga, uh, Iminga, is capitalism to allow corporations to violate human rights? Let's rethink a market economy that respects rights. Uh, and another one here, where do the youth fall into this equation? The next generation, in other words. No one is talking about how they can be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. You're nodding your head in agreement there, Leo Bernard. Well, you know, in our, in our country, uh, this issue of uh, youth comes right back to the same question about making choices across generations. You know, our fiscal debate is fundamentally about how do we share the gains and the losses across generations? Are we going to make the longer term cuts 
raise the revenues that will enable our young population to get the skills they need, for instance, to be productive members of society. But, you know, we go back also to this earlier question that was asked about uh, in some of the Arab Spring countries. It was not that those countries had too much or too little of capitalism. They had a uh, set of institutions uh, that were not democratic, not accountable. So you had youth, uh, women who were not included in the decision making. As a result, you had an economy that did not provide real opportunities for youth, for women, and that is the fundamental shift in fairness that's being addressed, we hope, right now. Nick, on the, on the question of how much profit, it's very simple. Competition, 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 innovation, innovation, innovation. That will bring profits down to its natural, healthy level, I would say. You can't uh, define arbitrarily. It depends on each sector. It depends on whether there's a market leader or not, and whether they're taking advantage of Open it to competition. Block all the, uh, you know, the disadvantages, the obstacles to competition. Get, have more open markets internationally. Uh, eliminate protectionism, trade protectionism, investment protectionism, foreign exchange protectionism and we'll be better off and we'll find the right level of profits. Lair Bernard uh, mentioned Egypt. Let's go uh, to Mohamed El Khao, a global shaper as they call it here, between 20 and 30, one of the new entrepreneurs you've been tweeting uh, during this debate. You're a founder and chief executive of the Toledo Foundation and you come from Egypt. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, actually made the revolution uh, getting stuck right now in Egypt is that there was no vision. And if I recall uh, from Alice in Wonderland uh, when she was lost and she asked the rabbit, where do I ought to go? He told her, where, uh, which road do I ought to take? And he asked her, uh, where do you want to go? She said, it doesn't matter. And then he told her, it doesn't matter which road do you need to take. You're speaking about developing leaders. We're constantly debating what is the method, but we don't know where we're going. What is our vision? We need to develop leaders to be visionary. We lack visionary leaders, and then we can start discussing the method. So I think we need to change the question. Where are we going? You've also tweeted uh, that uh, you need a new capitalism that, quote, is inclusive of the new world dynamics. What do you mean by new world dynamics? What I mean by that is that uh, the young people uh, are no longer looking for the one leader, the savior. They need inclusion. They need collaboration. They need open platforms. These old things of structured programs, structured curriculums are, no, are not working anymore. So we need things that are more open and include more people in the decision making rather than having one person deciding everything. Anders Borg there, the perception from the 20 to 30 year olds who are already very successful, uncomfortable about the state of the economic system at the moment. Well, I, I agree that we need uh, to see more, le less of inequality because it, it is also a political factor in this crisis. Societies that are divided are not able to deal with crisis or continue to reform in, in the long term. So. We, we need to find broad-based political support for, for, for going forward, and, and that means that uh, social cohesion is also a, a political asset in terms of, of being able to continue to reform. So for any country to build an inclusive political and economic strategy, I think, is, 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 at, is at the core of starting a, a long period of growth and sustainable development. This need for a real new adaptation, Nuria Rubini, this coming from the next generation, which I've been hearing a lot of here in Davos. Well, I think that social media can make a big difference because uh, in addition to traditional democracy, I think that from the Arab Spring to what happened recently in Russia to the fact that in China you have 300 million people on their own version of Twitter complaining about inequality and corruption to the fact that even in the United States a recent law was pushed back by having a popular movement just last week saying over the internet, Twitter, Facebook, we don't want certain piracy laws and so on. I think there's ways to have more direct democracy in which people can express their views, the young, those who are not in the political system is going to make a difference. So we want democracy that is more inclusive, but more inclusive means to give voices to the young, to women, to poor, to people that are not in the traditional political process. And from this point of view, I have to say the internet, the social media can help to make a good difference. Anders Borg, you're a politician. Are the politicians listening to this social media, some of which we're getting here on the world debate? Well, I, I strongly think that accountability has been stepped up over the last few years. Because do the politicians realize the obligations now? We have an obligation to listen, obviously. I mean, an open society is based on the fact that criticism and, and discussion can take place. And if you look at, at uh, Europe, for example, it's been quite clear that a government that has not been able to tackle the crisis has not been re-elected. 
So I think also the political game is changing here. You need to be long term to be able to, 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 to have voter support. Well, Leo Brennard, let me come to you because a recent Pew Research Center poll in the US said that only 50% of Americans react positively to the term capitalism, 40% reacted negatively. Among Americans aged 18 to 29, more had a negative view of capitalism than a positive view. Now, this at a time when, for example, one Facebook near Serentil is saying, we need stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism. But that point particularly about understanding the new generation out there who are disillusioned because they can see what's going on. Well, I think in the U.S. Uh, the answer uh, is uh, very clear. We've seen increasingly skewed uh, income distribution. We have an educational system that is not doing its traditional job of providing uh, equality of opportunity regardless of the uh, uh, child's uh, parents' incomes, and we have a lot of work to do to redress the imbalances, uh, the unfairness that's grown up in our system, and, and we'll do it in a way, and we'll do it in a way, I think, uh, that will be very responsive uh, to the young generation. Just going back to this question about open platforms, though, it's not just a question in places like Egypt of open platforms uh, for governance, which I think are critically important, but also creating the ability for young people to start businesses. And that goes right back to the form of capitalism. Can young people in the Egyptian economy get access to finance to start small businesses? So it's really democratizing the capitalism as well as the uh, political system. But let me put it to you, is there a kind of generational time warp even in Washington where you're thinking the old think rather than the new think which the next generation are clearly wanting? Well, I think in fact uh, in, in Washington it's very much focused on uh, opportunities for uh, the new generation and uh, looking forward to the future of our country and realizing we've got to get ourselves out of some of these stale debates and move forward on a fiscal compact uh, that is fair and balanced and move forward on addressing the long-term competitiveness of our economy. Public perceptions here, Angle Guria. Frankly, I think in Washington it's the other way around. President Obama is the one who is leading the charge and the time warp is right there and uh, the two uh, uh, will not mix. Uh, just a question about a ruling uh, or governing uh, and listening to the uh, social uh, uh, networks. Uh, uh, this is fine, but, but in the end, rulers are elected to take tough decisions, even if they may not be popular. And if you're looking at the polls every day of every one of your decisions and seeing whether it's going to be popular or not, the result can be rather disastrous because you end up not taking the necessary decisions. And by the way, I don't agree that in the Middle East they don't know what they want. We get the same, the same recurrent demand to say that is ways to uh, encourage jobs, of course, to create jobs, governance, anti-corruption, transparency, uh, the things that will underpin a healthy, vibrant economy, a healthy, vibrant democracy. Again and again and again, it's the same demand, even from governments that change. They come back the same. The fight against corruption in particular is one very, very strong one. Let me give you uh, one tweet we've got here uh, from Tsuta uh, I think that the main issue is how to regulate the incredible greed of Wall Street and the city in fair ways. Now, I'm putting that on the agenda because, of course, for the last three years that has been the issue. But that is still the perception, Norio Rubini. Uh, certainly, there is a perception that nothing changed, that in the good times uh, there were profits, there was risk-taking, uh, there was excessive compensation, that we privatized those gains, and then when the mess occurred, we socialized the losses and we put them on the balance sheet of the governments, and we've created a massive public debt problem. We also have a question of fairness of the taxation. In the United States, you know, labor income is taxed up to 35 percent, while various sources of capital income, whether it's capital gains, uh, dividends, uh, estate taxes, or carried interest, is taxed much lower, as low as 15 percent or even lower. So a worker may pay 35 percent marginal rate, while a private equity investor pays 15 percent. That's not fair and it's becoming a social and political issue. So those are the kind of things that throughout the world we have to address. Otherwise there'll be real backlash against it. But this issue again of the Occupy movement, it hasn't really taken off in many ways in terms of numbers, but it's made an impact. Is this a real hostage uh, to what is coming for, pol for politicians, Leo Brennard? We've had it here in Davos as well. 
I think that if you look at the changes uh, that are uh, moving forward in our financial system, they are profound. The Dodd-Frank Act is profoundly transformative. But do the public understand that? I, I think it will take time for us to see the full impact of that. Do you that. have time, though? Our look banks it off by Wall Street, already, look it let off me just point out, our banks are already running with capital buffers that are three times as great as they had going into the crisis. Leverage is much reduced. We are now seeing uh, rules being written to regulate for the first time the derivatives markets, to bring them out of the shadows, to subject them to the same kind of transparency that we have on many bank transactions. I think you're seeing already the impacts of some of the compensation reforms and we're hoping to move forward on this very significant transformation of consumer finance practices in the U.S. So I think those things will take time. These are structural changes, uh, but they are extraordinarily significant. And I think you will see the result being uh, a much better allocation of capital towards productive uses. You in say the it US takes economy. time, Leo Bernard, but on the other hand, the perception out there is not enough is being done fast enough. It's not just in the financial area, it's in so many areas. You're the politician here on the, on the panel, Anders Borg. Mm -hmm. Do the politicians get what is, being, what is happening? It's cold in many capital cities at the moment. Spring is coming. There's a lot of anger. A lot of people in the public sector are going to start losing their jobs around the world. Is this something which is looming as a dark shadow for the politicians? Well, I, I think we must also see this at, as that the voters are, are uh, grown up and very realistic. I mean, when now, for example, in Italy, they've done substantial pension reforms. They've actually seen a very mature reaction from from the voters and it, it's very important that when we're talking about reforms and social cohesion that we're not naive we are not going to recreate uh, uh, unemployment traps and poverty traps we need to have uh, a so so society based on cohesion that also brings out the growth we cannot see Italy or Spain moving ahead without becoming more competitive and, 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 and growing better but the public is wanting growth and expecting it much quicker than can be really delivered by the dynamics of capitalism this contradiction almost well, I, well I, I think we also must be fair about democracy democracy is about anchoring uh, your your political decisions among the voters and um, voters want to see what are the consequences how are we going to deal with different principles how are different interest groups going to to deal with this so democracy means also that we're not going to do a, a uh, a systematic uh, change overall our system but that we have to do gradual piecemeal changes how much is this a looming shadow at the moment do you think Angle Gurria the public and their concern the Occupy movement even though it's quite modest at the moment this is a very obvious uh, part of the problem today take the question of the firewall you mentioned a while ago well uh, uh, what is the condition well there will be a bigger firewall to the extent that there is a de facto fiscal union and maybe a de jure fiscal union at some point in time the discipline has to be there le rigueur has to be there le rigueur must be de rigueur oh no this okay the problem is that takes years to put together and the firewall needed to be there six months ago and it needed to be big Credible, the big bazooka had to be in place. It's not there yet as we speak today, and the credibility is not there yet. The losses continue to accumulate, the uncertainty continues to accumulate, the trust continues to be destroyed because of this asymmetry between the timing considerations. There has to be a bridge and there has to be a lot of explanation, there has to be capital, political capital spent saying it is not possible to get us out of this thing in, in three months and six months, but there is a clear roadmap and that roadmap has to be explained uh, for democratic purposes to get legitimacy. There's irritation out there. A lot of people are still not convinced. Here, for example, from Akasim Usman, a tweet, capitalism as a concept is good, but the problem is the capitalist cabals that hijack the capital from society. Nuro Rubini. Um, well, in the latest uh, IMF reports, they worried about maybe a repeat of the 1930s. If you think about it in the 1920s... Do you agree? You're Dr. Doom. Uh, uh, I say there is a risk. In the 1920s, there was a gilded age. There was a rise in inequality. There were financial and speculative excesses. Then we had the stock market crash. Because of the wrong policy response, it led to the Great Depression. Then we had trade wars, currency wars, capital controls, defaults, inflation. And then because of the social and political instability that came out of that, we had the rise of a bunch of authoritarian regimes in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in Japan. And we ended up with World War II. 
Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but we have to think about the fact that if we don't resolve the fundamental economic, financial, fiscal, social, and political problem we're facing today, there is a huge amount of source of instability within well, countries and across countries. So the challenges we're facing are serious, and we have to take this problem seriously. Well, let's get a voice from those who are in difficulties, who live in difficulties. Uh, Sheila Patel, chair of the Slum Dwellers International. Do you think those you represent who are some of the poorest in the world, will be convinced by any of the arguments you've heard up here? I'm sorry, none of this would make any sense to any of them because they're beginning to lose complete faith not only in their own politicians but this uh, global uh, market forces that are supposed to transform their lives. That's what they hear. I just want to bring to your notice the fact that there are uh, three things that are happening simultaneously. Market forces are making cities the growth of engines for development, not only in these big economies, but all over the world. And all the protests that you are talking about are also coming from cities. And there are younger economies which are trying to follow all the mistakes that all of your countries have made. And they are producing cities in which more people are living informally in slums and informal settlements. You're talking about infrastructure in the United States. You have to see the crisis in all these cities in the global south. Livelihoods are getting informal. There is no way by which informal entrepreneurs can get anywhere. So what we're so talking I'm, about here is, and it's something the OECD has been warning about, income disparity. This greater inequality which is emerging uh, with capitalism. Something your president uh, talked about literally a few days ago in the State of the Union, uh, Leo Brenard. This issue of inequality, it's a haunting the capitalist system. And in a recent risk report here at the World Economic Forum, they said that, not terrorism, not climate change, income disparity is the biggest threat now, the biggest risk to the world. Yeah, I think certainly uh, in uh, the U.S. context, if you look at the gains uh, in the earlier part of the decade leading up to the crisis and uh, over a longer term, you saw a disproportionate share going to the wealthiest with the lowest part of the income uh, distribution losing. And during that time, changes put in place to the tax system that reinforced rather than offset those trends. And so we need to turn that around in the U.S. We need to turn it around internationally. We are working with our international partners to do that. I think the single most important thing I'll have to say that we can do right now uh, to lift uh, the uh, people in the poorest countries is to get our own economies back to more sustainable growth, to create jobs at home, which creates but demand around the world. But it's also the poor people world. in your country, the people in, in the sink areas who can't even afford bus passes at Absolutely. the moment. Absolutely. We need to be creating jobs across uh, the U.S. economy in such a way that we bring people back into the labor force. You know, unemployment in the U.S. is a terribly destructive force. It puts stresses on families. It essentially under, undermines that whole positive uh, spiral of, of social mobility. And so that has to be our number one focus in the U.S. economy. Angle has got to be putting people back to work. The labor market is the source, the largest single source of these inequalities that we're seeing the whole world over. So that is where uh, the target should be. I just wanted to uh, comment on the slum dwellers uh, representative. The process of urbanization, we're not going to turn it back. The question is, how do we plan the cities? How do we provide the services? How do we provide the green? How do we provide the proper taxation? How do we provide the proper water, the electricity? And how do we make it possible that there is a, a good quality of life in the cities? Because the cities, if anything, are going to continue to grow and the growth is in the developing emerging economies. Actually, in the developed countries, the cities are uh, coming, you know, they're, they're sprawling. And uh, we can work with them a lot better. But in the uh, uh, developing countries, we're going to have to work very seriously and plan the cities. Cities is where everything is happening, All right. where emissions, etc. everything is happening in the cities. Anders Borg. Well, I think we also must understand the perspective, for example, from the Germans. I agree with Angelo on, on, on the firewall, but let's also remember we are seeing a right-wing populist reaction in North Europe to this. If people are perceiving that money is wasted in bureaucracies, inefficiencies and corruption... And the capitalism is failing. Well, we must also have conditionality and tough love here. It must be the case that people are also doing the, the necessary things. Otherwise, it will not be a firewall. But that's happening already. It's, Policies are changing. There's a lot of change. It's starting to happen.
tough decisions are being taken. Let me go to China, because one of the interesting debates, literally in the last few weeks, has been about state capitalism. Let's go to uh, uh, Fu Jun, who is dean of the School of Government at the Peking University in Beijing. What kind of capitalism are you comfortable with in China? Well, China is, uh, relatively speaking, very new to the theory and the practice of a capitalism or market. But the question that we have is, we are students to that idea and we are doing practice of capitalism or market-oriented capitalism. But now the question is, it's a very serious question. To what extent have we gone wrong in theory and the practice? And the question is, to what extent can we continue to learn from advanced market economies and vice versa? Do you have a clarity of what kind of capitalism is emerging? Well, we have been reading very carefully about the great economists like Adam Smith, Douglas North, Ronald Coase, and we are sensitive to the fine line between hierarchy and the markets. And during different stages of development, different countries probably will have different proportions to the two lines, market and the hierarchy. Right. We're coming to the end of our discussion. We're never going to resolve the issue of what future of capitalism, but let's get a sense of where you think we've got to and what has to be done. Leo Brennard, quickly, if you can, please. Well, I think uh, we have uh, a system that uh, tended towards large imbalances, uh, very uneven distribution of the gains. And going forward, we have the same challenges, I think, whether you're in China, in the euro area, certainly in the U.S., we have got to move forward with growth that is both more balanced and more fair. Nora Rubini, can that growth come from the current capitalist system with all its flaws at the moment? Well, all the various variants of capitalism have their problem. The Anglo-Saxon laissez-faire model has failed. The social welfare system of continental Europe now is a fiscal crisis. Even state capitalism eventually is going to be problematic for China and countries following it. We have to find the right balance between the fact that economic activity is going to occur mostly in the private sector, private enterprises. For, for those private enterprises to thrive, you need to have skills, education, investment in human capital, infrastructure, public investment, and the right balance between a state that provides efficiently a variety of public goods that make then productive activity in the private sector balance. So you have to find the right balance. Uh, balance and sequence. You know, in the euro crisis, we decided to build a common currency before having a common uh, fiscal uh, policy. Uh, uh, then now we're finding out that we have to uh, do it all over again and maybe put the sequence right. So it's sequence, but I would say the politics, the politics, the politics. Let me put this to you. We've just had a tweet from Eric Prenan. We don't need elected leaders. We can manage ourselves. You're no an elected way. finance minister, <laughs> Anders Borg. We need democracy. We need stable societies. We need more of social cohesion and reforms. Uh, we cannot create a solidaric society by building welfare traps. So cohesion, but also continuous reinventing our own welfare models in Europe. Welfare models within capitalism. Can it be fairer? What we're getting here is tweets which clearly indicate they're not convinced. Well, I'm a European. We have a societal model where we are trying to build a social market economy to combine the society with good chances for those uh, worst off for social mobility. That is a good model. Democracy and the welfare state combined with the market is, is a good model that we have to renovate but have to bring forward also. Renovate but bring forward. That's a great way to end. Anders Borg, thank you very much indeed. Angle Gurria, Nora Rubini and Lynn Brenner, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We haven't reinvented capitalism, but thanks to all of you here in Davos and those who contacted us from around the world. We've only heard a small selection. We may not have heartened you about the prospects of what lies ahead, but I hope at least we've enlightened you on the enormity of what still faces us all. From Mina Gowing here at the World Debate in Davos in Switzerland, bye-bye.